Today's episode of Beyond the Mask is presented by the insurance specialists at BrightThink Wealth Strategies. Find the disability insurance coverage that fits you best right now. Email Robert Smith at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. The show is also made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. Get a free consultation today to be guided through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Just visit crnafinancialplanning.com. We'd also like to thank Helping Hands and OSA EMR for their support of the show. And don't forget, listening to our podcast can earn you Class B credits. For more information on how you can submit them, check out the CE Credit tab on our website, beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Welcome to Beyond the Mask, innovation and opportunities for CRNAs with Jeremy Stanley and Sharon Pierce. We know you spend your day caring for your patient's best interests. On our show, we want to care for you. Join us as we leave the operating room and learn the latest in the CRNA industry. Beyond the Mask starts in 10, 9, 8, 7. Sharon, what a special day. Oh my goodness, I am so excited about this. I can't hardly stand it. I know, and here we are in Raleigh, North Carolina. I know, you had to drive this time. I did have to drive down (laughs) this time. But, you know, this is a moment that I don't really think we thought when we started this podcast that we would get here. No, I don't think I really so. Don't. And most podcasts don't make it past seven episodes. That's so true. we did that. Yeah. So this is our 200th ah, episode. Can you believe 200th it? 200th episode. Back in 2018, we started and now we're on number 200. Yes. That's with amazing. a million downloads. A million downloads. We're what? I can't even count that high, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as long as you got a million dollars in your bank, you're good. Well, you know, don't that's worry about what that. I have you as my <laughs> financial planner for. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I think the important thing is, 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 and what this shows is that you and I really are committed yes, to giving back absolutely. to this community. Yes. And you know, we've we've seen times that it's hard to to release every week, right? Mm-hmm. It's hard to develop content, and this is a lot of work, as we all know. Um, but we're committed to it. Absolutely. And we're going to continue This is just the it. beginning. It's just the beginning. We've got lots of good plans. Well, let's think about, you know, all the stuff we've been through. I mean, gosh, we've got Class B credits. Yes. We've developed out the historical series. Which everybody loves. Everybody loves. We do the financial series, which yes. I love, whether anybody else does or not. I just but hang on for the ride for that <laughs> one. <laughs> we do, you know, live podcasts at meetings. Yes. Which is something we we never thought about. We've won the PR award for yes, the ANA, which is absolutely wonderful. We're in the top fifty medical podcasts consistently in the country. It's amazing, and we're number one in the CRNA community, and downloaded in one hundred and twenty five countries. I think it's more than that now. Oh, actually. really? Yeah, we're wow. gonna have to update our stats. So, so yes, so so this is something that uh, we're excited about, and. We've got some other things going on that people are going to learn about here very soon. Let's go ahead and spill the beans because it'll already happen when this airs. Oh, yeah. That will happen. Yeah. So we've got the clinical series Series. that we're going to start doing with Jeremy Squared. (laughs) It's another Jeremy and Sass. Yes. So now we'll release six times a month when they throw there too. Since, you know, obviously this Jeremy can't do the clinical side. Yeah. Yeah, because people would die. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, but they would. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of a lot of traction, a lot of yes. things behind us. And, the um, new doctoral committee that's going to start yeah. looking at student presentations. And we'll, do, we'll have several of the students uh, who need to disseminate their doctoral work on the podcast, the podcast. But they've got to go through an application process right. and be chosen. So yeah. we'll get the cream of the crop. Absolutely. And, and you know, as we develop out more of these verticals, as, as you call them, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think we want to hear from folks what they want to hear about. Absolutely. Because we think Beyond the Mask could be so much more than what it is. And I, I think we've we've thought a lot more strategically well, COVID about thought this. Beyond the Mask was a lot more. It, we <laughs> never knew the connotation of no, the name, did no, we? No, when we no, named it, no, we didn't know what was no. coming. And thank you, Deb Flaherty, because yes, that was her idea. Absolutely. Never forget was. that day in Charlotte. So, so a lot going on, but also we're also excited about our guest today. Yes, we are. So, our 200th episode and 
just this just fell in our lap, basically. Yeah, we and were, I drove two hours yes, to come meet did. with her. Yes, you did today, um, and and we're very excited, very very excited. You want to introduce our guest? Absolutely. We have Rebecca Love with us to talk again with us. We had her on. Uh, it's been a couple of months ago, and. Jeremy and I were absolutely blown away. Um, we were actually in the studio together, yeah, we and were. we are looking over the computers at each other <laughs> going, oh, my God. And we asked her immediately that day, would you be our 200th episode guest? Yeah, um, and maybe we can get her to do some other stuff. We'll talk about uh, that later, yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, we've the, got some more verticals to welcome, build. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, Jeremy and, and Sharon, thank you so much for having me. And such an honor. Thank you so much for taking those two hours to drive over here. <laughs> I, I'm just so flattered and so honored that well, you Well, you flew from Boston. I drove <laughs> yeah. from Winston. We're all good. Yeah. We're all good. We'll, we'll call it a wash. So, and I think this is, is very special because, you know, one, you're, you're a nurse entrepreneur, but you're also a visionary for the nursing industry. And today we're going to be talking about the power of nursing. And I think a lot of our CRNAs don't realize the power that they have and nursing mm-hmm. in general has. So that's going to be our topic. And I know you're also speaking about that here at the, the North Carolina Association Nurses Association. Nurses Association. Yeah. I wanted to say A and A, but I didn't. <laughs> um, so why don't we just kind of kick it off a little bit and, and talk about your background because a lot of our listeners might not know who you are, but you've got an exciting background. You got a lot going on. <laughs> well, thanks, Jeremy. No, I think you know, like both of you, I think that um, nursing took me down a couple different paths. And I think for when you were talking about the power of nursing, is that I think that we thought that it was defined for us that we would stay by the bedside, that we would be a bedside nurse for our lives and that our careers would unfold like that. And I think what we realized or what I started to realize is that when you started to really cultivate, when you would start pulling back those peels, those layers on the onions, as they say, opportunities started to unfold. And if you took hold of them and you didn't fear the unknown, which I think Mm. many of us do. Yes. And take risks. Uh, the whole world can open up. So to your point, you know, I, I had a company. I exited it. I've written a book, started a nonprofit, built the first nurse innovation program in, <laughs> in the United States out of Northeastern. And, um, you know, ended up at, you know, as a chief clinical officer, of one of the fastest tech-enabled platforms for nurses in the country, while sitting on the boards of several companies and starting a couple others to further advance what we can do as nurses. So, <laughs> good Lord. And she didn't even take a breath through she didn't all take of a that. Breath. Forgot. We know she doesn't sleep. Wow. <laughs> And the thing is, is that we kept up with that, both of us being know. from the South, you know. I mean, we were able to, to follow Roll along with, with this, so we're good. We're getting better at that. So, so yeah, I mean, a lot of exciting stuff in your world. And you know, nursing is changing, um, good and bad, mm-hmm. I think. And, and we're going to talk about that today. And why don't we just kind of hit some of the statistics of where nursing is today? Well, yeah, and, and Sharon, I want to hear from you as well on, on how these statistics resonate with you as a CRNA, but um, just, just some baselines. The average age of a nurse in this country is actually 55 um, years old, which means 50% of that workforce is over the age of 55, and 70% of that workforce is over the age of 40. So we see this very yeah. quickly graying demographic of the workforce, um, where a lot of people are like, oh, well, we produce 175,000 nurses a year, so you know that's not going to be a problem. But the reality is, is uh, you know, traditionally we lose 50% of those new grads by the bedside within two years of practice, but one of the most startling is for the first year ever, this was the time that our new grads actually have been the largest demographic to leave nursing and it's in the history of our profession. Up to nearly 70% mm. of new grads who graduated with last year are reportedly not practicing in nurses at this point in time. 70%? Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just sitting here listening to what you're saying, though, and my, my head is running the numbers. So there's fi- about 5 million nurses in the country, right? Correct. Average age, 50 to 55. Uh That means in the next 10 years, over half are probably going to retire. So that means two and a half million are going to retire. We're replacing at a rate of 175. So we've got a net deficit there. And then if people are leaving in droves because they don't want to be at the bedside, it sounds like a problem. 
Yeah, sounds like a big problem. <laughs> and in the CRNA community, the average it, it, age is... It's the same, 51, 52. Is it really? Yeah. Yes, we're seeing the same thing. Same thing. And how many are they graduating from CRNA school on average a year? Do you About 3,500. Yeah, I think it's a little less than that, actually. It's like 28, 2,900, I think. So it's not resurplacing um, at the, the rate that we no, need it to No, it's the same. It's the same, almost the same dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we pull from nursing, so that makes well, absolute true. sense. That is true. That, and, you know, we're... We're hurting <laughs> sometimes the nursing profession in general because we take you the pull away cream of the crop too. You do. Yeah, um, to but, but I mean, even anesthesia. getting people to be CRNAs, you know, we can have the debate all day long about you know the doctorate level versus the masters and the additional costs and the additional time and you know it, there's a, there's a lot to it that that's going on right now. So um, and there's there's one thing that I have to say about the CRNA space that I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for is that the CRNA space is by far the largest entrepreneurial organization, I think, of nurses in the country. They have done something that no other group of nursing has done, which is they've largely broken away and represented themselves back to hospitals and negotiated the terms of which they work, which I actually think speaks volumes to the traditions of where nursing started, where in the 1920s, when nursing really sort of broke away from the history of the the profession um, and and was founded, women had the right to vote and nursing became the largest economic uh, vehicle for women to have economic freedom. Back at that time, it was nurses had their own independent practices and would license their service to both the hospitals as well as to private uh, Mm. families to actually create sustainable models. We saw that model actually be clamped down on in the early 1930s when, when reimbursement came in, which I know we've, we've mm-hmm. uh, discussed before. But um, the truth is, is that I think that CRNAs hold such an example of both the power of nursing and where it can go and the really um, incredible entrepreneurial spirit that still lives alive within our profession, largely based in that, that subset. Right. That is true. And CRNAs were the first APRNs who got third-party reimbursement, right? And we've got podcast on that we with do. Sandy and Nancy talking about that and how it happened in the late eighties. Yeah. But before you got here, when Jeremy and I were talking, have you ever read the book The Medical Monopoly? No. Oh my God! You'll have to take LeBay <laughs> Law to read it. But it talks about how nursing really, even when hospitals first began, they were began by nurses, yeah. the nuns. They're yeah. all Catholic or Jewish or yeah. you know. They're all of religious uh, backgrounds, and nurses ran them, began them, and then they gave it away. And that's in the medical monopoly. But you read that book, you get the libido law because you're going to need it because your <laughs> blood pressure is going to be sky high. Oh, my gosh. The history of so much of our history has been buried. Um, and I yeah. and that the power of nursing has been history and our memory, our collective memory of it has really been rewritten um, in, in ways that I think have been such a detriment to us. I, and I, I know that, you know, when we're talking about the power of nursing, a great, incredible group of nurses uh, they called Nurses You Should Know really said our collective memory is basically, oh, the world was going on. It was suffering from Florence Nightingale came, founded nursing, and boom, 200 years later, here we are. And and none of that 200 years of history, of nursing history or impact, has been documented well across medical history or historical history. And many of these stories, like the ones you were just talking about, have never come to the fruition. And, mm. and we don't talk about them in nursing education and nursing right. school. And, and the truth is, is we battle to recreate the power that we've always had because we've lost so much of that history. And I, I just love talking to you guys because I think you are exemplifying um, those stories and bringing back the power of what our profession has always been in terms of, of of having the conversation and being able to lead. And this is what the power of such things like these podcasts are. We finally taking back our voice and having these conversations in a way that have been largely left out of these larger conversations. And and it's so, so I want to thank both of you guys for doing what you're doing because I know 200 episodes of podcast <laughs> is not easy to achieve. That's a lot of talking. <laughs> That's a lot of hot air at this year. <laughs> but it's critical. So you guys are, are making Really well, and, and you know, too, I mean, I look at this industry from a completely different viewpoint. And, and, and one of the things that I see with with nurses in general is is the lack of business knowledge, the lack of and understanding. And no one teaches it. I mean, even in the doctorate level programs of the CRNA school, they get just a smidgen of it, but they don't get it. They don't understand it. And I think in order to change this culture nurses have to understand that they do have the power and part of that is understanding how business works because healthcare whether people want to believe it or not mm-hmm. is a business it is about money yeah well we're not it's a line item 
Well, we're not a line item. <laughs> I mean, true. we're part of the room. You don't uh, see. You don't <laughs> see. You don't get your hospital bill, and it says nurse hundred dollars a day. Now, uh, yeah. We are. You're right. That is true. Uh, with the with the room and the linen and <laughs> everything else, we're not even a line item. And hmm. you, uh, one Never of the pro- well, think about this: you can't quantify what a nurse does. You really can't. It's because um, they do everything. Well, they do everything. <laughs> it's kind of like a mom. You know, you, know? I mean, <laughs> you walk you walk down the hall, you look up, you see the chest tube. Uh, you know, the mm-hmm. water bubbling. You can't charge for that, but you know that the chest tube's working. You see that the patient's pink; <laughs> they're breathing, yes. um, and you yeah. you go to the next patient and yeah. you, you're doing so many things all at one time i've got an old picture from my anesthesia mom she started giving anesthesia the year i was born and it's a picture of a crna but they've got like all these hands and eyes are everywhere it's a caricature but it's absolutely true you know sharon you're saying something so important and i think that what what we really have to understand is why we're facing the nursing crisis that we exist today as nurses being rolled into the room right b- basically being as valuable as bedpans or sheets in that room and Ooh, snap and that hurt you know <laughs> but it's true uh, but the reality is is that every other profession gets to bill every right. other profession right. is is uh is serviceable so more doctors more pts more ot's generate more revenue for hospitals, more nurses mm. generate more costs without associated revenue. So in oh. a sense, we actually don't even have a reimbursement model for nursing. Wow. We have been rolled in and, and mm-hmm. hidden and invisible. And so the reason that healthcare is failing today is because there, uh, the, the reason people go into hospitals and nursing homes is for nursing care. Right. right. Everything else could be done outpatient. Surgeries, diagnosis, right. OTPT. Right. Otherwise, you could go and stay in a hotel after your surgery, right? Mm-hmm. But the reason you're in these settings is because you need 24-7 nursing care to keep you alive. So when we inherently do not have a reimbursement code for the largest profession of healthcare delivery services, how can hospitals and nurses uh, mm. and, and nursing homes support the nursing workforce when they can't reimburse for them? Well, they mm. just see us as, a, as cost. a cost. And that's the misalignment. Well, so some we people see that. you guys as a cost. I, I will... I will oh, argue that just a little bit because I think they're making skin off of your back. <laughs> and, and, and the underlying tone, <laughs> the underlying tone is, oh, we're making all this money off them. Let's not let them know it. <laughs> yes. Right. Actually, there, and that's, there that's is what happens. That. Yeah. There is something to that. Well, let, let's kind of talk about leadership. How are nurses faring in leadership? Rebecca. So, uh, so knowing that nurses are, there's 5 million of them. They're the largest healthcare workforce in the United States. Surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly to our audience, less than 25% of healthcare leadership roles are actually our nurses in them. So wow. over 75% of all leadership is, that dominates this huge workforce has no understanding, does not come from a nursing background, but dictates and manages and creates the policies, procedures, and work environments in which nurses operate. Right. So fundamentally, I think that, you know, when we're talking about leadership, uh, we can see that as a, you know, half glass full or a half glass empty. But I, right. I really like to see it as, okay, now we have an opportunity. Opportunity. Mm-hmm. We have yep. a huge opportunity yep. to drive more. But to your point, without understanding the business of healthcare, without speaking the language of strategy and finance, right. um, and actually being able to talk to the impacts that nursing have and, and translating that conversation, because I, you know, as nurses, we all talk about, oh, I think, I feel, I believe kind right. of conversations. <clears throat> it doesn't move the CFO. And right. I have to tell you, even in my role as a chief clinical officer in my business organization, I often failed, I recognize, to make a, um, you know, a persuading argument because the way that I present it doesn't speak to the way that the business speaks to their key initiatives. Right. So it has been a gap for myself to learn how do I manage and effectively convey the absolutely mm. critical points from a clinical officer perspective, being mm. a nurse, yeah. to speak to the CFO, to Chief Story, Chief So Legal what officer. are some of those lessons that you've learned? So I have to, you know, so a couple of these lessons, um, there are things called OKRs, you know, or KPIs, Key Performance KPIs. Indexes, yep. and, and they all drive to two things, which is revenue or cost, right? So money. Mm. Um, money. And <laughs> that's, <laughs> why, that's why I can do this, Rebecca, because it all boils down to money. to money. I mean, yeah. ultimately, I can um, make it all come down to money. You absolutely yeah, can. Yeah, I can. Uh, I the can answer's that money. Down. What was the question? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but so, that is exactly yeah. it. And we as nurses <clears throat> don't have that. So no. right. And we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about it. No. We've been told that money is a bad thing as nurses, right? We right. actually, are, it's ingrained in us that we should be doing this job for because basically. Because we're angelic. Yes. And <laughs> we we're, just, we're amazing. And we want to give it. mercy. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and you know what? And that basically, we that money and we should stay, and that actually started in the 1930s when they did this. They tried to keep nurses as far away from the money in hospital as possible. That's why mm. they rolled us into sure. room rates. And that's why they kept physicians in the positions to mon- manage those things. So I think when you're looking at this, um, people ask me all the time, Rebecca, should I go get my master's degree in, uh, you know, in nursing? And I say, you know what? I believe the unstoppable degree that will change the future of nursing are those nurses who go out and pursue their MBA alongside mm-hmm. their nursing uh, degree. Right. Because I think you're seeing it down here in the South more than we're seeing it up North. But many of the nursing managers are being replaced by those with MBAs because the reality yeah. is managing is managing to the bottom right. line. And nurse right. ratios, nurse to patient staffing ratios, um, often are being much better managed by a hospital's finance perspective when an MBA manages it than when there's a nurse in there managing those numbers. Um, so I think that there is just a, a, a necessary uh, leveling with nursing that we need to start talking about that, you know, money and finance is not a, a negative turn. And right. it's something we need to have a much better understanding of and to be effective at actually saving the profession and ultimately with it healthcare. Yeah, and I was, I was reading something that you had in your uh, presentation. It said, 40% of nurses disagreed with the statement, my organization really cares about my well-being. Oh, my Lord. Forty percent. Well, you know, Sharon, you CRNAs went out on their own, right? Many right. of you have gone out on your own. Why? Why did you do that? Well, to take care of my own destiny. That's and and that's the reason why a lot of CRNAs do that. And was it? Did you feel? Did CRNAs feel a, a lot that there that the systems were not necessarily looking out for their destinies or for their uh, futures? Or? Well, I, th- I think, I think it, for us, it, yeah. for us, it's a bit it, a bit different. I think. All right, I'll give you an example. When I'm in the operating room and a surgeon is dressing down uh, the circulating nurse, nine times out of ten, they'll never talk to me like that. Yeah, interesting. Because I've got their patient asleep on the table. And nine times out of ten. Now, uh, on the other hand, they will say some, a surgeon will say something to a female anesthetist he would never say to a male anesthetist. And I tell... I tell students when I teach them, and I'll find a a male and a female student side by side, and I will say, you know, we've got to be better than our medical counterparts because a surgeon would say something to any anesthetist that they wouldn't say to a physician anesthesiologist. But I'll point to the female and I go, but she's got to be better than everybody because you know, a surgeon won't say anything to a male anesthetist because in the locker room, the male anesthetist will cold cock him. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so uh, yeah. to your point, I think, uh, you know, CRNAs don't deal with a lot of the things that mainstream nursing does. It does. And I, yeah. I think you point out an interesting point. 95% of the nursing workforce is still female in the United States and even larger numbers globally. Yeah. And there is a very uh, interesting alignment. And this isn't only unique to nursing. You can see it across education and our teacher systems along those lines is this feeling that as uh, being a woman and in a caring profession, uh, that we are, you know, responsible for managing very, very much without the ability to actually drive a lot right. of the changes mm. that uh, associate yeah. with it. There needs to be people above us to manage us and to define what and how we do. And I think that is a fundamental misgiving where when we know when we step across the threshold in a hospital, it's the nurses who run that hospital. Right. And I think fundamentally, uh, when they're saying that they don't feel supported by their institutions, they feel unheard or that they have their well-being in their best interest, it's showing you that there has been an always and an ongoing mistrust between uh, the front line and the administrators. And just very representative, I mean, the na- the massive nursing strike that's taking place in Minnesota today. I mean, 15,000 yep. nurses walking off the job in Minnesota is, is, is a telling movement. This wasn't yep. just a hospital uh, situation. This was a statewide initiative by nurses who said the entire system of healthcare in the state of Minnesota is failing wow. us as a profession. And I don't think that this is our first strike no. that we're going to see this year. No. I think we are going to see massive amounts coming down the pipeline. And I, I fundamentally believe that all of these apps that they're putting out and all of these other programs that they're saying, hey, we're going to better support you. They're not really addressing the inherent problems that are facing the profession. And with it, right. um, I have a lot of hope for profession. But I have to tell you, I've never seen the amount of despair that I've seen in my colleagues as I've witnessed in the last uh, two years. Yeah, and we COVID. Thought, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we thought it was all going to get 
get better, right? Yeah. But we just did a study that we released today through through my company that said 51% of nurses feel that things have not improved from the depths of COVID. And 70% of them are still feeling very uncertain about staying in the profession. Have you thought about what would happen if you weren't able to work for two or three years? You know, on average, 25% of people will file a disability claim, and most of us aren't prepared for that loss of income. Every CRNA needs to protect their biggest asset, yourself and your ability to earn with a disability insurance policy. We recommend contacting Robert Smith, a master disability insurance specialist with more than 30 years of experience and 1,800 CRNA clients to find the coverage that fits you best. The best way to do that is to send him an email at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. That's rsmithjr at financialguide.com. Or call him at 504-394-6557. I want to go back for just a minute because you said something that kind of caught my attention. You said 95% of nursing is still female. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about that is in the CRNA community, it's 50-50 now. No. It's always been. It's, we wouldn't even well, let it. Well, it always we, been. I well, mean, it's kind of worked it has its way. Been, it's see, been a higher male believe percentage, Believe it or not, right? let's see. Next week I was eight years ago when I took office as AANA president. Yeah. And it was 47% male. Yeah. And now then. it's 50-50. So when you were talking, I, I was just thinking in the back of my head, you, you know, and, and you asked Sharon the question, well, you have a, a more, I mean, coming from a male, but more of a male presence here who are standing up for themselves and the females see that and then they do that. But in nursing in general, you don't have that model. Hence, and, and what you see actually to your point is men actually, those that are in the profession, they raise through the ranks of leadership much sure. faster. That so was going to be the next numbers. question. I'd like to know what that uh, it is. 25% is it, percent, 75% how that breaks percent are still raking out as men, right? Yeah. Um, well, so. you can have one male in your <laughs> nurse nursing class and they made him president. <laughs> <laughs> that was even, oh, there, oh, there, oh, just make me so mad. There, there is a lot of inherent, um, right. you know, challenges that this profession faces. And I mean, we're not uh, alone that, you know, Know, our male counterparts still, you know, a, a female nurse in a similar role to a male nurse is still, sure. you know, making that 70% right. of, of what those right. ratios are. These are these are not inherent. The problem is it's just extenuatedly much of a greater impact because you are dealing with the way that nursing operates at this point. Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it up just a little bit because, you know, nursing really has become more of a high stakes profession. And, and we saw that with the nurse at Vanderbilt, wasn't it Vanderbilt? Oh, my. Um, yeah, redundant, and, redundant and what happened much. there, and, you, you know, we were talking earlier about you know, the North Carolina Supreme Court uh, enacting some changes as well, where nurses can now be liable. Um, so what does that mean? I mean, in, in all of this for the future of nursing, I mean, my daughter is in nursing school right now. And, um, you know, she's going through what you got to go through in nursing school. I mean, ultimately, she wants to be a CRNA. But what does that mean for that nurse coming out and thinking through this, that now if I did something wrong, I can go to jail. So I think we always knew as nurses um, that if we made a mistake, we could lose our license, we could lose our livelihood. Right. Um, but I don't think we ever thought that a mistake, which honestly the environments in which we work in, and healthcare is defined as a highly complex environment, which means that there is very few repeatable processes that work in every system across across the industry. And what what we're realizing is that if you make a mistake, you can now be held criminally liable, which right. means you can be prosecuted, lose your license, lose your life, and go to jail for a mistake, largely many of us feel, that are is outside of our control. And I think the stakes for nursing have gotten to a level that it may not be worth it. And I struggle yeah. with looking at my own kids, in, in full yeah. disclosure, to say, you can go be a nurse. Because here, I was thinking on my plane ride down here, nursing is, people say, get paid a lot. And I said, but, you know, I'm thinking about this. When was the last time that a CEO or a vice president of a hospital was criminally charged for a mistake that happened at their hospital? Right. Has there ever been a physician? Never. A physician, yes. Charged? There Just recently, <clears throat> but it, he got off on that, the Florida one where he was actually found guilty of actually overdosing patients right. in the hospice out down in Texas. Um, he, he was found guilty of actually purposely administering patients he felt that did not have an right. a, a end-of-life path, huge amounts of doses and killing them. But, you know, he was very, he was not, right. um, this, this was the one that we've done. But nurses in 
this case with Rondon Devat was a mistake that we largely saw through system failures. And she self-reported, which is also right. the violation of what's referred to as just culture. And I think that we're dealing with a situation in the nursing world that we want to be in a spot where nurses can do their jobs without fear. And I think right. what this culture has done is it's totally going to cause us to hide our mistakes. Sure. Not well, going to have us come uh, forward. We've always been a punitive system. That's why we can't get past the errors I mean and this is why (sighs) I think there is a so knowing that you know CEOs and vice president hospitals make a substantial amount more money right but don't have the liability that nurses do so nurses make a substantially less amount of money but carry all of the now liability not only the you know what we first thought of of losing our license and you know being financially responsible we all carry on insurance but now to lose our entire life and I thought they're thinking to myself is I have three little, not little, little kids anymore, but three kids. What that meant to me if I was sitting in front of a jury who I had been trying to save this patient's life, I self-reported. And then I'm sitting in front of a jury who found me guilty and was going to send me to jail for seven to 12 years. Yeah. And what that meant for me. And what that meant that my daughter would be in her 20s by the time that I ever saw her again. And I think there's a lot of nurses out there in the world right now thinking, I got into this profession to save lives. And I've got in this profession and saw us through COVID. And when nobody else would go out of their homes and nobody else would step across that threshold, when the physicians and the hospital administrators stood on the opposite sides of sheets of, of glass, shouting ad- ad- directions to us as we dealt <coughs> when there was no cure and no treatment for these patients. And I have to think that they just said, it's not worth it because you don't have my back. The systems don't have my back. The doctors don't have my back. And right now the American public may not have our back. I don't think we ever thought as nurses that a jury of our peers would find nurses criminally negligent and guilty of homicide for a medical mistake. What do you, I mean, I'm going to put you guys on the spot a little bit here, but what do you think is, is pushing this, this, this movement, this, I mean, because we, we're seeing it, you know, like I said, in North Carolina with an, an overturn of a law that has been on the books since, what, 1932, Sharon? Um, there was a, a CRNA who had a case down in Charlotte um, who, you know, could have been held criminally liable for this. I mean, what's pushing this? <laughs> <laughs> You know me, I'm always going to put you on the spot. Uh, so, no, I mean, I, you know, my, my theory, and, and it's just a theory, but I mean, there, there's got to be something. And in my mind, I'm looking at this going, okay, well, you know, nurses are, are trying to push the envelope a little bit now. CRNAs well, definitely at, are. In the South, we're getting too big for our britches. <clears throat> well, yes, like yes. So, so, you know, in my mind, and, and just this is the way my mind works, you know, somebody's doesn't like that fact and they're putting a little bit of pressure on law enforcement and you know attorneys and the system to say hey you might want to put these people back where they belong i mean is that and again i'm i'm this well, is, I, I, it's an interesting <clears throat> it's an interesting thought one that i have not not been able to run down the entire thing but i i do know that in the case of rondon devat the attorney general was up for re-election and mm. by appearing to look tough on medical mistakes and systems it looked uh, like he was protecting the mm, population and gotcha. he was re-elected he ah. was reelected for prosecuting a nurse. So that's um, the way they portrayed this. Yes. They do. And I think that they're starting to, you know, I, I, I let's be honest, medical uh, deaths are the third, you know, are the third leading cause or medical errors are the third leading right. cause of death in the United States. Something that we haven't been able to prosecute or uh, people did not think that they would prosecute. And then if the attorney general is up for election and he's looking to win the favor of the people mm, and go after go. what appears like m- mistakes and harming of the public, this might be a whole new trough of of Mm, opportunity to gain public sentiment that you are doing something in this industry and we know that for example right now in a nursing home they're prosecuting a director of nursing criminally for a fall of a patient who they didn't send to the hospital he died two days later and that that don and that head nurse are being charged criminally for neglect and abuse of an elder person and i just wonder who's going to be there to care for patients right. when you do these things? Because right. I, I, everybody who's listening to this podcast have been on the front lines and you recognize that 
what you don't know and the clinical judgments that you're making there, this is as much of an art as it is a science. And that if there was a machine out there that could tell you every time something was really, truly wrong instead of a false or whatever, the reality is we could probably do our job better. Um, but right now it is still a clinical judgment and you are working in a situation with less than ideal ratios in most places. And the reality is mistakes happen in our world. Because we're human. All right. Well, let's back up and go, uh, to, Another thing about money. <laughs> How did you feel about them introducing the bill in Congress to cap travel nurses' pay? <laughs> So I think that, all right, now that is a loaded question for somebody who could come for me. I don't, let me just fully disclosure, we don't do travel nursing in my in my company. <laughs> um, but I think it's absolutely, um, you know, it, it was absolutely done as a favor to the, the hospital associations and a way to deal with the massive amount of what they saw was a spike of, I don't know if you know this, but yeah. the average travel nurse budget prior to COVID was only covering 2 to 4% of staffing openings that were opening at any hospital. It, because right. of COVID, it's up to about 24% of what they consider their overall bud budget. So it said it has blown them mm-hmm. past their reimbursable bottom. Wait a minute, nurses are important. <laughs> Is that what you're telling me? You might have to pay them to get oh them to gosh. come in and do wow. something. Oh my we God. really do need them. Mm-hmm. And oh. that, there's, that they actually have a value that you should be paying for. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, so, now we're getting somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. So, Sharon, I would be curious what you're thinking, but I'm guessing that the direction of where this question is going is absolutely what they just did was strip away the free market dynamics of a democratic yeah. system that basically yeah. said that, you know what, market dynamics, basic economics, which a lot of those people right. up there on Congress are constantly pounding for their big other corporate clients, <laughs> let market <laughs> dynamics control what the market yeah, exactly. will pay. Don't regulate this space. Why are they regulating nursing? Well, right. and they never regulate medicine. No doctors. Um, have okay. they? Hey, what uh, are anesthesiologists what make? What are surgeons make? What about make? CEO salaries? Why don't we regulate them? Why don't we? Why don't we uh, cap hey. CEO salaries? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, there's a lot of the debate about that. And that's why the nurses in Minnesota are striking. They're looking at their CEO pays of their hospital systems that are being paid $18, $20 million a year, which could yeah. cover a lot of nursing salaries. But to your exact point, why of all the professions did they decide that they were going to cap nursing pay out of no doctors, no no other specialists, no right. vice presidents or CEOs or anybody in the healthcare industry, but only nursing pay was the one that was breaking the straw on the back. And I think, again, to your point, was it because nurses were getting too powerful in the system? Mm. And did travel nursing under threaten basically the financial stability of hospitals if nurses started to go out on their own and demand the salaries that they were deserving? Hey, I have an idea. Why didn't the government subsidize the nursing's pay like they <laughs> subsidized the, the bailout in 2008 and they subsidize every other industry? Uh, they subsidize airline. the farmers. You know, I mean, industry. I'm not, not against I mean, that, but I'm just saying, you know. That's I mean, a very good point, Jeremy. Well, I, mean, I never thought about capping, that. It's true. Well, under the CARES Act, in a sense, that's what they did, they did. right? Yes, sense, to a that's certain what they extent. Did, yeah. But that money has dried up. But the problem is the shortage of nursing has not resolved. And this demand on right. travel nurses still exists. Now, let's be very honest. We know that the industry is cracking down. Most hospitals yep. are restricting travel nursing um, ones. But I think that the argument is that we should be saying out to everybody here is if we start to establish these kind of policies, that you cap the pay of a free democratic society, of an entirely free workforce, is that workforce really free? Right. And I think fundamentally this argument shows that nurses are not. They are really going to be, that there is a greater pressure out there to actually control this workforce in a way that would be anti-competitive in most other conversations anywhere in this this economic, uh, uh, greater economic conversation. And one that we should all be pounding on, even if you don't like the idea of travel nursing, the idea of capping salaries, once you cap one, you cap all of us. Cap them all. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What CRNAs are next? Yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, yeah. the the pay for ten ninety nine has gone up dramatically as well. So, I agree. so, so, how do we change the yes. status quo, Rebecca? What do, what do we do to change this? Oh goodness gracious! So, the status quo, I think we should just define it first. Is doing um, business the way it is and seeing that there is no other options, right? The status quo just means that there's resistance to it. We're going to keep operating business the way that it is, and I I think that we have to look at that through the eyes of a lens of a man much smarter than I, who says to do the same thing over and over again and expect mm-hmm. different Insanity. results. Exactly. I Einstein said yes. this. So um, the status quo right now is not working in nursing. So we're living right. insanity over and over in healthcare. And the, the best way that we could actually solve this is to throw caution to the wind and say, we know it's not working. So in my, one right. opinion, we have to change the reimbursement <clears throat> model, make nurses reimbursable the same way that all of our colleagues are, I think is one. But two, it's time that we innovate. And what I mean by innovation mm-hmm. is we have to really start looking at the way that we look at these problems and allow ourselves. And what I would say is allow the front line to tell you how you would, they would solve these problems. 
and they would know those answers. And nurses are natural innovators. They just don't know that they're innovators. What do you mean by that? When you well, say innovators, what do you mean? Well, in, uh, in my perspective, nurses figure out a way to get it done. Right. And, okay. uh, you know, you... you we interviewed Bethany how long. I love this right. line. Yeah. She says, when nurses come to a wall, they over, go around. over, <laughs> around, <laughs> under it, that. you know, whatever. Yeah. And, but they figure out a way to get it done. That's <clears throat> figuring out a way to get it done is innovation. a non-classy way of saying innovation. Yes. But nurses don't see themselves as, as that. Just like running for office, a nurse, their eyes will glaze over, but yet they would be perfect right well know. jeremy let's right. look at and sharon let's look back at covid the hospital systems failed everything we thought yeah. we knew about healthcare largely went out the window the way that we treated patients managed right. payments how they should be positioned in bed all of these things everybody left except the nurses mm-hmm. so they had to stabilize our healthcare system yeah they were the ones who showed up who ran the uh the oh, I, that just gave me goosebumps mm-hmm. they had to stabilize the healthcare system but we're gonna cap their pay i digress but anyway but we allowed them to innovate yeah. because everything else had failed. Mm. All of these archaic mm. rules and programs and policies and procedures and hierarchy that had existed in healthcare for the last hundred years came tumbling down around us in COVID. And mm. the only ones left standing were the nurses to pick up the pieces with those patients. Mm. And ah. they innovated and they built hospitals and they built new wards and they flipped patients onto their stomachs and they started to do IV pumps from outside the room to d- extend, uh, you know, tubing, which could never right. have been done without years of study, but they did it in the moment. They started to use devices to do remote monitoring, which they said could never be done. They did so much that was said they could yeah. never be done that they executed against and they came out and they saved Healthcare. They saved millions of lives that without yeah. nurses, they're innovating during the COVID pandemic that would have died. Hmm. And suddenly COVID's over and hospital systems and healthcare systems are pulling back pulling to back the way that it forgetting. was. Mm. Yeah. Get, and putting rolling the them artificial ba- yeah. barriers And back they in. wonder why all these nurses are leaving. They wonder why we are leaving and saying, forget it. I just sacrificed my life. Many of these women out there that had were mothers that were in divorce, they couldn't see their kids. Many of the families could not go in and see their families for months on end, living in hotel rooms. Yeah. They sacrificed their lives. They sacrificed the risk to their licenses. They sacrificed their families. And somehow we went from <laughs> hero <laughs> to zero, as so many people have well, said. I mean, we were good enough during a crisis, <laughs> but then... We're we're not good enough anymore. You know what this reminds me of? Oh, it's just like with the with the, the, the military the, CRNAs. The CRNAs. Like I they're mean, all they send the CRNAs to the front lines <laughs> in the military. Yes, because the anesthesiologists are too valuable. Yes, but the CRNAs are on the front line. But amazingly, when they come back home. They can't. They do get what they dumb, do. and they need the anesthesiologist to oversee them in the VA system, because what they do out on the battlefield obviously isn't as important <laughs> as what they do here, which is both saving lives of the men and women that take care of us and take care of our country and fight for our freedom, which is the same right. thing. Well, whenever I explain it to policymakers, I said, "You, you know, their IQ goes down as they fly across the ocean." <laughs> <laughs> or just step across an <clears throat> arbitrary line, or you know, going from North Carolina to Virginia. I mean, yeah, an arbitrary true. line, yep. and your IQ changes. My IQ changes based on the time of day. Seven <laughs> o'clock in the morning, I can't do anything by myself. Three o'clock, I can do more by myself. At midnight, I'm a genius. <laughs> Gosh, and it even changes if you go from a uh, metropolitan area to a rural area, doesn't Isn't it? Isn't that something? Huh, and yeah. so, you know, I think you're hitting on something, this arbitrary nature of how nurses feel disposable and unimportant and unheard and valuable in one minute and completely unvaluable the next is this arbitrary world that we lived in. I think that you guys are, you know, you're beautifully summarizing up the the dichotomy that exists in our reality Mm -hmm. that I think what we're especially seeing from the younger generations, they're not tolerating. Right. No, next they will not. They are coming up, <laughs> no. and the, why are they leaving the bedside? Why are they not tolerating this? Is because they were told nursing was one way, and they're getting out in the real world and recognizing that it is a place still largely of being highly disempowered. Now, how do we get that power back? And I think that you know, we, it's where we started our conversation is that we have to be looking at believing in ourselves, recognizing right now, in all honesty, that they thought past COVID, things were going to settle down and go back to the way they were, they weren't. That means that we still have an opportunity to change the system in a way that before people wouldn't listen. But what we cannot do 
is talked still to ourselves. Like we need to be looking external for partners who understand mm -hmm. the system and the value that nurses have to advocate for us. Because mm. we've done, and, and this, you know, right before we started the podcast, Sharon, what I am so excited to spend time with you on and all these other nurses that I'm meeting down here at the uh, North Carolina Nurse Association Conference is there's so many coming from different backgrounds, powerhouse rock star nurses mm -hmm. from different specialties who in their own niche, have, like you, are one of the greatest voices in their niche of nursing. But together, we've never come together. Mm. And I think that that is what needs to happen, is that yeah. at the largest healthcare workforce, we've done a really good job separating ourselves <laughs> and defeating mm -hmm. our own progress amongst ourselves. And you know what? In spite of being the largest healthcare forces, in spite of the AMA, we have failed ourselves. And it is going to take us coming together, putting aside our own. We, we fight for power within ourselves because we find no external power. And if we together mm. combined what we saw is, hey, you know what? A rising tide raises all boats. What's good for CRNAs is good for nurse practitioners. What's good for RNs is good for LPNs. And the truth is, is that if together we came together in all of these situations and didn't carve out and fight for that mm -hmm. one small niche of mm. power or, uh, you know, rep or representation, we could do something for this profession because... Mm. If one part of us disappears, it weakens everything. Right. And vice versa. Mm. When we're all That's together, true. we can change that. Wow. Of that five million, does that include nurse practitioners, CRNAs, everything? So, so how large is is the physician side, the AMA? How large is that? So, there's nine hundred thousand physicians in the United States. So, they're one fifth the size of uh, nursing one in the United fifth. States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And yet, three nurses serve in Congress and seventeen physicians. And wow. uh, there were. 12 defeated in primaries in this last uh, election cycle. Beyond the Mask is made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. With almost two decades of experience, the firm guides CRNAs through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Schedule a free consultation today by calling 855-304-3748 or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. So where would the world be without nurses? I mean, what, Ooh, what would happen here? Oh, you know? what I mean, if? Yeah, you what, always ask, what yeah, if? What if? What's going to happen? So, and I think it actually steps back to let's talk a little bit about history. And so I'm going to share with you guys a story that I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, and how we present it. So, and, and it comes back to in the 1920s, women were fighting for the right to vote uh, and the women's suffrage movement. Nurses were central to solidifying the women's suffrage movement and women's right to vote. Mm -hmm. And in that 1920s, though, as we mentioned before, nursing became the largest economic vehicle for women to be successful. There was massive power in that. They started to build their own companies and, and do those things. Now, at that time in the 1920s, hospitals were actually largely failing mm -hmm. in the United States. They mm -hmm. were a place where only the most destitute would seek care. Huh. It was deplorable conditions. Now, as surgery invented, hospitals started to bring nurses in. And what happened was um, nurses, uh, patients would be issued two bills. One would go to the nurse and one would go to the, uh, you know, the hospital. And often, the nurse would be paid. So we started to create this economic oh. Oh. Uh, disadvantage for hospital systems. And they started to realize, though, that the care level <laughs> in hospitals and the outcomes of patients got much better. So one could argue that nurses saved hospital systems. They helped women get the right to vote. They went on to save right. the hospital systems uh, that were already founded largely by the nursing movement. And, you know, when we come then fast forward, there's numerous other advantages of what nurses have done. I mean, we, we you know, it was the nurses um, who, you know, basically solved for polio and the treatment of jaundice in babies. Um, mm. These amazing nurses, I, I don't know if you know this, but um, uh, Mother Teresa actually trained as a nurse before she opened up her oh. treatment centers yeah, in the slums yeah. of India. But mm. there's Harriet Tubman on, yeah. you know, things was also a nurse. There are incredible stories of these things. So we fast forward to COVID. Nurses save our healthcare system, but in the last hundred years, we've saved it twice. Mm. So I wonder if we've started to realize that without nurses, there would be no healthcare in this country. And I think fundamentally, if there were no nurses, there would be no healthcare. But more fundamentally, what would that mean to the world that we live in? Mm. As one of the only professions mm. that are told to provide empathy and care and a risk to yourselves among all greater things in life, that's what nurses do. And wow. I can't imagine that the world's going to grow up and just produce a whole bunch of YouTube stars or football <laughs> players or, uh, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about what is going to happen yeah. to the fabric of America if we don't have nurses in this culture. Because I don't know any other profession 
who often will cook the meals for the people sitting next to him who are suffering or check on that patient who is injured down the street or look at that one who lost their wife and go over there and make sure that they're okay or check the blood pressure of a patient who just came out of the hospital and they can't get a visiting nurse at home because we do that. Mm -hmm. But we also do other things. And I think the one thing about nursing is intrinsic to the fabric of this nation is it's empathetic, it's kind, and it represents the best of our country. Hmm. And so if there were no nurses, there would be no health care. But I also don't know if the world that we lived in would be less kind and less empathetic and a world where we saw division for sake of only power. Because nurses break that down. We treat the most destitute. Regardless of your economic situation, your color, your race, your sexual preference, we take care of you. And we need that in our world today. I'm listening to you talk. I'm so into what you're saying and you say it so emphatically. I mean, it it, it is amazing. But what you just described to me is power. Mm. That's what you just described. Without nurses, there is no health care. That's power. That's where the power comes from. As long if, if we could just harness it and well, realize it. That's but what you most guys are nur- here for. Yes. <laughs> uh, but most nurses just don't realize it. They, yeah. y- you know what? I can't stand this term. I'm just a nurse. Mm. And when somebody says that, I'm like, I don't want to ever hear you say that no just a nurse and that's how we quantify what we do because we don't have a way to explain it it's never been right. measured to us nobody taught well, us nobody to knows so to what we do <laughs> exactly yeah, exactly. Either you hold hands or you empty bedpans and the reality is is i keep you alive and i what i mean by that is that nurses have the knowledge expertise and skill sets to keep patients alive 24 7 and 24 hours seven days a week mm-hmm. when there is not a physician by that bedside Their care, their delivery, their monitoring, their natural intuitions, their ability to manage hundreds of millions of dollars of highly technical equipment and medication and and procedures is what they do. And I think the power that we have as a profession is that we recognize that if we can totally recognize that without healthcare, there's not going to be nurses, then it creates new avenues for us to be able to advocate, to start new companies, to build new organizations, to create conversations that would otherwise not be had in areas that would currently keep us out. And it starts with demanding more seats at the table at creating a place that when you are not welcome you pull yourself up and one of the best piece of advice I ever got was from a woman by the name of Shauna Butler she actually oh, overseas yeah she, she you was now our hundredth episode that's right we talked about this <laughs> and you're two hundred this is it oh my gosh I can't wait to talk to her and tell her but she always said you know if you don't have a, a, you know a seat at the table you you need to bring a seat to the table but more importantly that the way that that if you're not in the room you're on the menu that's yeah. it there you go that's exactly <laughs> it that is yeah. exactly it. and we have to we have to change the yeah. way that we look at ourselves and um which she, i'm sorry the advice she gave me and she said rebecca stop going to nursing conferences mm-hmm. and i was like well, she what tells do you mean? me that yes and why why did she tell you that uh, uh, you need to have Broaden. Broaden your horizons, yeah. I guess, for a, a, a better only, reason. And to look at how other professions or groups deal with yeah. issues, not just how we do. Yeah. But not only that, I feel like when I've gone to non-healthcare uh, nursing conferences and I show up at a healthcare conference, being the only nurse in the room, I've never been seen as more intelligent or knowledgeable or Mm. smart because in that room, these people are talking in hypotheticals. It's all these C-suite executives and doctors Mm. who are spending no time on the central floors. They're not in the actual Mm -hmm. conditions. So when they sit there and they say, hey, we should be solving it this way. And I'll be like, well, that's not how it's done in the hospital. (laughs) That's not how nurses operate. I mean, a patient doesn't flow through the emergency room to the ICU like that. It never happens like that. (laughs) Here's the processes that you have to understand. The reality is, is that when you start going out and nurses start engaging, engaging with people who normally don't talk to them. They start to understand your value, especially those Mm. in healthcare who have Mm -hmm. the money, who have the businesses, who are trying to infiltrate, who are trying to sell products. The nurse has the knowledge by which to be successful in the industry in Mm. a way that a physician could never explain, in a way that a CEO could never explain. You want to know how medical devices are adopted? Let's be honest. If a nurse doesn't use them, they fail. The truth is, is that what we could be doing as nurses is we could be saying, you know what? 
we're no longer working with any device that doesn't have a chief nursing officer at that organization. Ooh, we're snap. not going to be working with a company who doesn't have nurses involved in the product design. Hmm. We're not going to be working. We're not going to use this device unless we get to test it first and give our approval to work with them. And then when you hmm. want me to come work for you at Hospital A, I'm going to give you a list of products to see if you have them because those uh. are the ones that I want to work with because they work mm. better for me. They don't make more work for me like so much of the stuff that does out there. Hmm. All of us know that the physicians do that. They specifically ask for the special surgery knives or the special equipment that they the want. The robot. It's <laughs> time for the nurses to start saying the same thing. It's saying, I'm going to work in a system that works better for me. And if you want me to work for you, here's what I need. Okay. Let's go back to the millennials in the equation. That, to me, as I'm listening to all of this and thinking about it, that might be the savior of the profession because millennials will not tolerate things that we tolerated. They just won't. They won't. Yeah. And, um, and that's why you're seeing them walk. And that's yeah. why, unfortunately, also you're seeing um, those that are joining the profession, if they are not walking, they're going on to advance practice as quickly as possible because yep. they don't find that the profession that they're heard, seen, or valued in the roles that they are. But to your point, if we are going to get that next generation in there, I was listening to a, a girlfriend of mine, he M. Nadell over at Mass General Hospital. They had their first residency program go through that started two years ago. 90% retention is the highest in the country that we've seen on a residency program. And she said, you know, this group is just different. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. are they are strong. They know what they want. They had no problems telling us what they needed to be successful. Right. And it was this program. And, I, and she goes, we literally bent over backwards for this residency program, which has never happened in yeah. healthcare, right? We right. Are, It's the nurse that was always forced to conform. But the hospital said, you know what? To try to sustain them, we're going to have to meet their needs. And so they literally bent over backwards to help these nurses feel like they could be successful in their roles. And yeah. I think that you're going to see the best institutions are going to have to start recognizing that to sustain that workforce, they're going yeah. to have to do more for the population that before, let's be honest, we never asked for it, Sharon, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we didn't ask for it. Well, I want to, I want to hit on something <laughs> and something that you've talked about is you went to a hackathon. Yeah. What does a hackathon <laughs> got to do with nursing? <laughs> So this is where nurses can innovate. And, um, and, that, and that's what I want to get to because I, yeah. have, have you ever been to Hackathon? No. Did you know what it was? After I talked to right, but people I mean, before like Shauna that, Shauna did you know what it was? No. I've never heard one of my CRNA clients or CRNA friends or any nurses that I, I've never heard anybody talk about a Hackathon except for you. Okay. And I think as I've looked at it, what an amazing way to solve problems. So, you know what? And it was, and they, so I'm so glad that you're even recognizing this. Um, hackathons weren't developed for nursing or healthcare. In fact, no. they were ex developed by Google and IBM and the big tech right. companies who basically said, you know what? We have these problems. Let's get all of our front end users, our designers into a room and let them identify the problems that they're experiencing. And over the course of a weekend, these hackathons produce such successful results for these businesses that it's become mainstream across tech industry. Yeah. So when I, um, I was a struggling entrepreneur about uh, seven years ago, I, 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 would, <laughs> I ran a small company and I was about to close the doors because I had a job board and I thought, you know what? Nurses need a job board, but nobody would use it. I had no idea mm -hmm. how to sell it. And I remember a friend of mine at the time said, Rebecca, you got to go to this hackathon. And I said the same question. I yeah. said, what the heck is that? What is this? He said, three day event people from all different backgrounds, they stand up, they identify the problem they want to solve, come up with teams, and then they, over the next 72 hours, get in a room and come up with a solution. And I remember um, showing up at that event, I think I talked to you guys about this before, and walking in to this room, CEO that was there of the hospital, major CEOs of Boston healthcare startups were there, every doctor and engineer and teachers and incredibly smart scientists and brilliant economists were all in that room. And as I walked around, I realized, oh my God, there's no other nurses. Mm. Um, I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> this is where the decision makers are, are meeting to solve the healthcare's biggest problems. <clears throat> but nobody asked me to leave. And I joined a team and there was a doctor on it, an engineer, a teacher, a scientist, a physical therapist. And we started to talk about the problem that we wanted to solve. And in walks the CEO of the hospital and he sits down and the doctor starts talking about how we're going to solve this problem. And I said, well, you know, that's not actually how we do it on the hospital floor. And, and he's like, it isn't. And so I explained the entire process. And the CEO looks at me and he goes, I never knew that. 
And suddenly it got out that there was a nurse at this event and everybody was seeking me out. Like, Rebecca, could this work? And I'd be like, well, no, it couldn't work. Or no, it couldn't work. And I have never had that kind of experience that people thought I was so smart and that I knew what I was talking about. And we, and I, I learned more about the business though of healthcare Mm -hmm. in one weekend than I had had in two years of trying to build a business because we had to get to a market fit. We had to understand the competition. We had to buy, understand who was the buyer for our product and how were we going to open up these stores? And I, I left that event thinking to myself, my God, if you only gave nurses the chance to innovate Mm -hmm. on healthcare's problems, what could you do? And that's how my life changed was chasing down I probably made 50 phone calls to schools across the country and the phone was hung up on me until I connected with Dr. Hanrahan at Northeastern who had come over from UBEN to become the dean. And she said, Rebecca, we're going to run a a conference on innovation and entrepreneurship uh, next summer. Why don't you run a hackathon? And I remember thinking to myself right in that moment, well, you know, I've been to a hackathon and, you know, sure, I'll run one for you. Like, no problem. And as we led into that event, nobody talked about nurses as innovators. Nobody had done a hackathon in nursing and we had no idea Mm -hmm. if anybody was going to come. And that was June, 2016. And that was two weeks before the event. My life changed because she called me and she said, Rebecca, this event sold out. Every major hospital in Boston is sending a team of nurses Wow. to attend. Microsoft is flying and J&J is flying and uh, Beth and Dickinson is flying and Mercer is flying. And uh, these major organizations want to know what a nursing hackathon looks like. And she said, we can't just have nurses come and spend one weekend with us and get all fired up to innovate. Um, I want you to come on and become the director of a program. And again, I asked her, like, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to do this? And she said, well, you know, yeah, we'll build the plane as we fly it because there isn't a program. But I remember that event kicked off and they had it on a Friday day conference and it was being led by one of the biggest nursing leaders in our state. And we were turning the hackathon over onto that Friday night and we had a room of 250 people in there. And at the end of that long day, you guys know the traditional nursing conferences, people Mm. were dragging, exhausted. And I remember the head of this person walked over to me and she looked at me and she goes, Rebecca, people are exhausted. Keep this quick. And I thought to myself, (laughs) oh my God, we're going to fail. And I got up there, and when you start off a hackathon, you have to ask the audience to stand up and give one-minute pitches. I needed nurses, and I didn't plant anybody in the audience. I was stupid. I was just trusting the system was going to work, that nurses were going to stand up, raise up their hands, and they were going to come up with problems. And I stood up there, and I explained the hackathon, and I said, so who's going to come up and answer problems? And I remember looking at it, and I said, I need you to come line up next to me. And for 30 seconds, nobody moved. (laughs) <laughs> and suddenly that was a long 30 seconds it was a yes. long 30 seconds because you just realized in that moment maybe i had this all wrong right and i think right. that's the things as nurses that when i talk about you got to face your fear of the unnerved but more importantly you got to face risking failure mm-hmm. and when that first nurse stood up and then the second and then third and we had 31 people stand up and give one minute pitches and you know who some of those individuals are today mary and larry the head of innovation, first ever nurse appointed to head of innovation at University of Pennsylvania. She was in that first crowd. He am now, Dedell, who is now the first director of innovations at Mass General Hospital ever appointed as a nurse. And Mm. those were my colleagues Mm. who stood up. And over the last five, seven years, we've been at this ever since, building hackathons, building each other, building Sanciel, and hope that together we can change the future of nursing through the power of innovating and giving them a chance to and, do it. And Sancia, why don't you just hit on that for just a minute? Yeah, so um, it's an organization, Society of Nurse Scientists, Innovators, Entrepreneurs, which was founded back in 2019 with the goal to really give nurses a place at driving forward healthcare innovation. Um, er- using the trust that we've earned, you guys know, the number one Gallup poll opportunity yeah. for the past 20 years, most trusted, that we could actually, if we supported each other, we could drive change. And let me tell you, there has been some incredible stuff. And the nurses, who they are today and who we were at the time, I was a community college professor with a failing startup, told that there was no chance that what I wanted to do was ever going to succeed. And if you've been one of those nurses, and I'm guessing, Sharon, you've been Mm -hmm. where I was, Mm -hmm. don't ever let somebody else define your success. Because the truth is, and and Jeremy, I know you took the same leap of faith building your own company. When you let other people define who you're going to be, the rest of your life, you're going to wonder what you could have done. Mm, Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So I'm sorry. That was my long-winded story. No, 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 but you brought it into a killer close. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't don't think we could have closed it any better, actually. I mean, uh, you know... I was getting ready to say, is there anything else you want to say? And I think you said it all. I think my eyes are watering with that one. Though. Well, I mean, I, we could probably wow. talk to you for another no, hour so or two guys. hours this about this so stuff. Amazing. But you I mean, it's, it's really good. But you know, I, I think the bottom line here is that first and foremost, nursing does need to change. There needs mm-hmm. to be a change. And that's not just the APRN community. It's the RN, the LPN, the whole community needs to change. There needs to be fundamental change. And and maybe these hackathons are the way to kind of drive some of this change. I mean, Sharon, I would expect you to take this back to the CRNA community now because oh I don't God, think they've ever done it. We would love to do a hackathon with CRNA. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, what a that's great idea that would be. You Could know? you imagine what you guys would solve? I mean, the problems that you're facing, that's the power of the hackathon yeah. is you identify the problem that's right. been the barrier and then you solve it. And yeah. I have to tell you, it's not just me, but so many nurses tell me a hackathon changed my life. It changed my life. If I had never gone to that hackathon, I can tell you I would never be sitting here with you today. And that's coming from, as I said, a community college professor, a young mother, of three kids with a failing startup who yeah. was on their way out. And um, it saved me. And if it can save you, then that's what you should be doing. Yeah. Well, Sharon. I don't want to say it. I don't want to end. I don't want to, end <laughs> I don't want to wrap up the 200th <laughs> episode, and I don't want Rebecca to leave. I so know. we're going to have to get her to move down here know, from Massachusetts right? now, right? Yes. So we can have her on more. Well, you drove this far. We could <laughs> we could go up there. I love that's true. Love yeah, Boston. you got to come to maybe Boston. We'll get maybe uh, we'll uh, we're going to have Boston. you come up and do your podcast. In uh, yeah, that'd be right. awesome. We'll Let us Boston. come to the hackathon. Yes, that's what we're going to do. Oh my goodness, Sharon, I think it's a wrap. I think so. The 200th episode, I think, is an amazing episode. And thank you, Rebecca. Yes. Congratulations thank you. to you guys. Thank you for letting me be part of something so historic and keep doing Absolutely. what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. I mean, you're, you're doing something that is groundbreaking, and you know that now. Um, but it's a tough fight. You've got an uphill battle, as you well know, as any nurse out there who has invoked change or anybody that has tried to change, it's an uphill battle. So. Yes. You but gotta, it's doable. You gotta have grit, and you gotta stick to it. It is doable, and you gotta believe. You gotta believe. You know you what? The believe. truth is, nothing's impossible, but it's not easy. So, Ooh. if it were, anybody could do it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> we're gonna do it, you guys. So we're gonna right. do it. Awesome. Well, Sharon. Until next time. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. And we want to thank our listeners for listening to Beyond the Mask and getting us to 200 episodes. And, and a million downloads. A million downloads. And Who would Sharon, have ever thought it? What can our listeners do to help us if they like the show? Well, if they like us, they can leave us a review, but make it positive. As we all know, there is way too much negativity Absolutely. in this world. That's one of the best ways to help us grow. Tell all your friends. Share it on social media. Yeah. We're in the top 50 medical podcasts in the country on the way to number... Number one, just like we are in the CRNA community. Absolutely. All right. As a CRNA, you spend years preparing yourself for this career, so we don't want to see you lose out on any of the income you've worked so hard to earn. The best way to protect yourself and give you the confidence that a major life event won't disrupt your financial future is through disability insurance. We've known disability income specialist Robert Smith for many years and have seen the work he's done with nearly 2,000 CRNAs over multiple decades. He can help identify any gaps in your existing coverage and fill those gaps by finding the best value on a policy. Contact Robert and let him know you heard about him on our podcast. Send him an email at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. That's rsmithjr at financialguide.com. Or call him at 504-394-6557. Protect your greatest asset as a CRNA, yourself and your ability to earn a living by adding disability insurance to your financial plan. Today's show is brought to you by the folks at CRNA Financial Planning, an independent consulting firm that offers financial planning services exclusively to CRNAs and their families. From planning for a child's future college expenses to building a predictable income stream in retirement, the firm is committed to offering you comprehensive financial services customized to fit your unique needs and objectives. 
If you have questions about your financial future, get them answered. Call the team at 855-304-3748. That's 855-304-3748. Or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. Hi, this is Jackie Rolls, President of the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists and President and Founder of Our Hearts, Your Hands, a global anesthesia support community that takes donations to allow nurse anesthetists in low and middle income countries to go to educational programs, buy equipment or textbooks. Your donations are tax deductible and we would appreciate your support. OSA EMR is a free anesthesia EMR developed by CRNAs that you can download and use on an iPad. Our nonprofit mission is to make sure that solo and small practice CRNAs can digitally record their anesthetics. To learn more, visit OSAEMR.com to download and consider donating to our cause. Remember, for CRNAs, data is destiny. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you like to listen to shows. Also, be sure to check out BeyondTheMaskPodcast.com. Each episode is posted there with a corresponding blog post, and we timestamp important parts of the episode to help you quickly get to the content you're looking for. Also, check out the special series section on the site. You can follow along and catch up on the CRNA History Series, episodes specifically about political conversations in the industry, or try the CRNA Personal Finance Series. It's all on beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And if you have a question for the show or want to be a guest or even suggest a particular topic, fill out the contact form on the site or send an email directly to us at info at beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And lastly, let's take the conversation social. Check out our Beyond the Mask podcast Facebook page and Facebook group.